Welcome to this episode of Video Learning Lab. Today, I'm speaking with Ruud Rees, an online teacher and video creator. In particular, he specializes in teaching people to simplify complexity via animation video. Ruud, welcome. It's good to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. All right. I'm excited too. So I know that a lot of folks have probably heard uh, of you from your YouTube channel as well as from your learning products for your Explainer Academy, but for those listeners who are hearing about you for the first time, can you tell them a little bit about your story and how you got to here? Yes, I'm actually a, a business graduate, so uh, I came into this creative world through a marketing job where I was told to finish a video that a colleague started, and she used this particular tool that uh, I got good at over the, the years. Um, and I created an, an agency around this tool, this animation tool, started to create videos for um, startups and organizations that needed their concept or service or product explained. And um, eventually I created a course on how to use this tool. And now I've slowly, uh, I'm sliding into, well, I'm already a full-time educator now, online teacher. I'm teaching courses now uh, using YouTube and also uh, selling digital products. So from, from provider of this service to, to teaching others how to uh, use this animation tool. And then I've just created so many explainer videos over the years that I also teach the underlying skills, not only the, the visualization, but also how to create the voiceover. And before that, how to write a script that uh, um, kind of lays the foundation for a strong, simple uh, explainer video. And can you talk a little bit about, you know, who your particular audience is? Who are the people you typically serve or who's reaching out for advice on, on how to create video? It's typically um, what you would call traditional educators, uh, coaches, consultants, um, experts of all kinds that are maybe a bit older than I am and coming into this online space for the first time, they uh, saw the need uh, for um, kind of uh, creating digital versions of, of everything they know during the pandemic. They needed to digitize everything, move their stuff online. Um, and they come to me because they consider animation as a format to simplify what they know. So if you're an expert at uh, brain uh, science or uh, brain neurology or whatever you call it, you know a lot, but it's difficult to um, kind of um, simplify that into something that's digestible if you uh, just uh, watch a two minute video about it, right? So um, these people are used to standing on stages, presenting live, uh, writing uh, long papers, uh, teaching uh, long programs where you have a lot of time and you have that direct face-to-face -face connection that gives you a lot more uh, time to explain and uh, a lot of empathy and all that stuff that that uh, you don't really get in the same way when you're just learning online. So they needed a format to condense what they know into something digital. That's typically uh, the, the people I teach, and it's from all over the world, uh, primarily Americans, but also uh, Europeans and Asians and uh, people from Australia. Uh, so I've taught uh, people from all over the world how to, how to uh, get this skill set around that's animation. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's fantastic. So you're, you've really, uh, you, you know, it sounds like things really took off post-pandemic as we kind of shifted from in-person to online. And, I'm sure there's a lot of things that people struggle with. In particular, something that comes to mind for me is when you're an expert, you kind of don't know what other people don't know. And so there's this kind of this curse of knowledge uh, of where, you know, you're trying to explain something that other people just might not have any background knowledge about. I'm curious, you know, what do these people struggle with when it comes to creating videos? You know, if, what are some of the, the big pain points for them? The two main struggles uh, lies in the... Well, I have this three phase framework, the script, the recording of the voiceover and the visualization, the animation. And it's typically in the first and the third phase that they struggle. In the first phase, script writing, that's about simplifying the very complex knowledge you have. That's, that's where you do that stuff, right? Um, the second phase is really just about production, getting a good microphone, getting the energy right, uh, mastering the sound afterwards so it's pleasant to listen to. That's not really such a, a cognitive um, task. And then the, the, the third phase where you have to convert what you wrote and recorded into something visual, getting ideas for animation. 
that's the second challenge. So copywriting and getting ideas for animation is really the hard part. Let's start with the, the, the scripting side. Obviously, there's a lot of writing that goes into it, but why is that part so difficult for people? Because if you don't have a script, the rest kind of isn't going to follow. So, so why is it so difficult for people to start there? What do they struggle with most? When you get started, they're used to writing maybe uh, long peer-reviewed papers about um, uh, raising your kids, for example. That could be a topic of an ex expert uh, I used to work with. There's so much to say and there are so many you know, books you've written and articles you've written and talks you've given. So now you have, let's say, 60, 90 seconds to say something about your field. And once you get started typing away, all of a sudden you have uh, 5,000 words, right? And, and then it becomes a lot of work to, to kind of um, shape that down to something that works in an explainer video. So uh, it's really about teaching them how to start from a point of um, extreme simplicity instead of just writing a lot, a lot, and then trying to shape that down. Uh, so, so I think that's just because they have too much to say and, and they're not used to um, condense or yeah, shorten their, their knowledge in this way. It's a new format that requires them to think about what they know in a new way. It, it's so interesting when you mention that because it's, you know, it's almost like video uh, you need to be even more precise because there's a lot of other elements that go into a video that especially like the visual aspect that you don't have as much almost runway to explain uh, something so in a sense it may it forces you to be hyper focused on exactly that one process topic or skill that you're trying to explain do you have any uh, frameworks or advice that you give people when you're talking them through this process of ideation and brainstorming what is something that you specifically tell them I, I got this advice when I was still a student, like uh, 21 years old or something. I was interning at a, um, a CSR, so I had a journalist as my mentor. And when I wrote my first article, I was super bad, right? I had never written anything uh, like this. I was a business student, so it was kind of a, an odd uh, internship to get. But she told me, you can always write another article tomorrow. And that was just such a good mantra. And I, and I say that to these experts, you can always create another video tomorrow. So try to choose a little slice of your complete knowledge and create a video about that. It doesn't have to be all encompassing. It doesn't have to represent everything you know. Just that little thing that you want to, like one question or something that you want to say, or maybe if it's a video for your front page, what is the super, super, super high level um, story about what you do. Right? That can also be difficult, but I think it's a, it seems like it's a big help for them to, to not um, think of this one piece of content as the, the piece of content, right? You, you can always create another piece. So, um, so I think that kind of takes a little bit of pressure off, of a little weight off your shoulders if you think about it like that. If they struggle to find that one little um, uh, kind of uh, open door, like what, what is the, the most um, simple or kind of uh, subtle way into this topic that they are teaching. And a super practical tip is to go to Google, write your topic into the search bar and look at the people also ask questions. Th there you will get inspiration to what, what are some of the most uh, simple, basic, frequently asked questions about, for example, um, how to uh, restore uh, uh, your relation to your teenage uh, boy or something. That could be like super specific expertise that you have. But if you just uh, insert or write something in, in Google search result there, you will get some frequently asked questions and you can use that as your angle into the topic and, and get that whole process started. That's something that I also use sometimes. Before we dive into your process of, of creating a video, something that, you know, I first ran it, when I first ran into, you were to me like the king of explainer videos, especially when it comes to like instructional or training videos. And that's your live content, that's your animated content that you're using. I, I, I'm curious, what is sort of the role of an explainer? I'm not talking about a, a marketing explainer video, but kind of what is an actual explainer video Maybe how is that different from your average training video? Or maybe it is. I, I don't know how, how you frame it to your students, but can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I see, uh, I see the explainer video as the surface level intro. 
I think it, it's best for that to kind of introduce you to a topic at a very kind of a helicopter perspective. Um, your first 60 seconds with this topic comes from an explainer video and then you can dive into articles, into podcasts, into whatever long form content if you're interested, but you don't know if you're interested and you don't know whether this topic is relevant to you. Then you have that very low investment of a 60 second explainer that quickly uh, flies you over the whole topic and then you can make your decision on which way to, to take this. So I see it like a, a surface level piece of content. Of course, you can make explainer videos for um, like deeper landing pages uh, or, or, or sub courses or something, right? But I think it's it, it works best at the surface level and it works best when it's primarily informational and not so emotional. I think that used to be kind of a yes. um, wrong take on the genre that you need to tell the story about. This is Lucy. She has three kids and live in the suburbs. She has a difficult time, uh, you know. This, this whole story is not uh, there to evoke emotions because the tool that I use compared to Pixar, for example, it doesn't have enough uh, facial features to maybe connect at an emotional emotional level. Uh, it's more, you know, stick figures that um, are to explain something simply, informational, factual, and not so much about evoking emotions. So I think that's also kind of a distinction where explainer video is something else than, for example, a talking head video where you see a person, you could you connect with the the author or the podcast host. Um, or you write a long story in text that can also be an emotional experience to read a book or something. Um, I think um, animation video, well, explainer videos are not really supposed to do that. Interesting. I, I, I really like that distinction because I think when people are often make, using video, their first task is they're using the video to excite, to make an emotional connection. Often that's why, you know, you might start with a talking head, mm. but I really like this way that you're explaining it of the role of an explainer video is just kind of the teaser where it's just like, you know, answering that question, is this going to be worth the next two hours of your life? Essentially just a, a quick high level way to cover that. But I think also that takes some of the, um, I think as you were explaining that it takes some of the, the weight off of what I feel like is my shoulders when it comes to using video it doesn't have this have to be this huge emotionally charged thing it can just be the the you know if you're look, it, it reminds me of like a hiking trail i'm looking at three hiking trails i'm deciding you know do is this one going to be fun for me what am i kind of in the mood for and then i think a characteristic that you mentioned also is that it kind of tells you what to do next or mm -hmm. what you can expect next if you continue on down this path i don't know is that is that a fair metaphor or am i am i reaching too much no, I think that's what it's best for. Of course, you can kind of squeeze the format down in different places and make it work for different cases. But I think if you take a few steps back uh, and look at where, where does this format shine, I think that is the, the informational high level uh, use case. Mm, sounds good. So, so now that we know a little bit more about explainers, let, let's get a bit into that process. For, for someone who is just getting started with video, can you tell them about where it is that you begin? What's the, the first thing that you, you ask folks to do? So the approach to figuring out how to create an explainer video for some startup that does something is to sit down with the founder, for example, and let them talk freely for 30, 45 minutes. And then during that whole uh, stream of information that they give you, you kind of uh, listen for and notice the small golden nuggets where the penny drops, right? Where you understand part of the business. For example, uh, right now I'm, I'm working with someone who does um, employee expense reimbursement, expense management, right? And you kind of know what it is, but when you listen to the founder talk about this, you have those moments in time during that talk, during that uh, explanation from, from him, where you say, that's a good formulation. That makes sense to explain it like that. And then you write that down. And after those 30 minutes, maybe you have three, four, five things. And then those are the bones. And now your job is to put meat on those bones. And that's the text, right? So you have maybe five bullets of things that you think would be nice to mention in this video, because that really makes sense to you as someone who, who doesn't have this curse of knowledge, who comes from outside and looks uh, as you look at this product or service 
as the viewer probably, right? The new viewer, a new potential client coming onto the website. What is it that they say that's interesting? And what is it that they think is interesting that you don't care about at all? And then your job is to like sift out those points and string them together in a logical structure. And then uh, the whole production part starts. So that's my approach to, to how we would distill the essence that would be ripe for a, an explainer video. And you, and you can also do that. It's harder to do like uh, onto yourself, right? You cannot really just, but um, it's something that uh, you just have to choose. I think uh, it helps me with the, the mantra there where you can create another video tomorrow. Uh, I put whatever I teach into a Google search and I see what people ask, use these keyword tools and I get inspired by that. I, uh, I see what others create and I think of ways that I could make a, a remix of that with my own topic. Um, so yeah, that's not exactly the same process. It's, it's a little more difficult to, to kind of do alone. But maybe if you're in the e-learning space, instructional designer, you sit down with the, the SMEs, the subject matter experts, and they can be the client that you listen to. You take notes and then you kind of uh, pull back into your office and uh, see if you can string together a script based on those aha moments that you have had during that interview. And you come back to them and, and show them the scripts and it's like an iterative process. And then eventually you lock down the script, the scripts, record the voiceover, do the visuals, feedback on the visuals, and then it's done. I think a general learning from uh, having uh, 250, 300 clients over the years that I had the agency is that the, the best videos were the ones where there wasn't so much pressure on, on pouring everything into that one golden masterpiece of a video. Then it would get like, if you have a, a bread dough and you just keep kneading, 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 at some point it just falls apart and it becomes super sticky and you cannot bake it and you cannot eat it, right? So, so the people who maybe had lower budgets, startups, for example, right? Bootstrap startups, they really wanted to be very involved in the process and, and keep going over the script again and again and again. And I think that's something to be uh, a bit uh, aware of that uh, that can actually ruin the kind of intuitive logic of of the the way you strung together those five points the first time around where the interview was fresh in mind you had your notes it made sense you understood the the kind of topic that you are to explain now you've kind of uh, uh, created an outline and, and written your script and then you go back and forth with five different stakeholders the ceo wants to say one thing the sme wants to say another thing you want to say something uh, you talk to customers and they have some points and all of a sudden you've needed this script into something that is just uh, for everyone and no one. Ah, interesting. He, as you, so, so a, a couple of themes come to mind and, and, you know, from, from this and other conversations that we've had with folks on video learning lab is that idea of experimentation where, and, and iteration, which I, I think you mentioned, but also you're alluding to something there, which is at a certain point you have to put a pin into what you are, uh, what those points are to mention, and you actually have to build and finish the thing so that you have something to iterate on, or you can move on to the next project, um, which is something that I know is a huge barrier for folks where that idea of perfection is really uh, a huge obstacle for creating video, especially if you're new to the medium. And so um, I really like this idea of just saying like, hey, I got my five points, I'm going to follow my gut, I'm just going to move on into the next, you know, recording and visualization once I have my script. Um, I mean, how, how, I mean, just because you talk about this, how do you know when you're finished or how do you know when you have enough information? Is there anything you're looking for or is it more a time bound thing? What are uh, some of the constraints that you use to just say, Hey, I've made a decision. Now I'm ready to move on. Um, it's, it's easier when I work alone, like I do now as a content creator. Um, when I get tired of the project, when I'm just tired of looking at it, uh, editing it, it and listen to myself. I mean, that's a good, a good proxy, right? Sometimes you just have to step away and come back tomorrow and do the last 5% uh, of editing. And that really makes it nice. Right. But, um, it's, it's actually, um, it's something that I'm working on to, to stay longer with the script writing, because that's really where the value is created. I'm very quick to move on to the fun parts, the production, the animation. But then you sit there or with a YouTube video, then you've created a, 
a software review or something, and then you sit there with the with the edit, and you thought, okay, maybe I should have spent just an hour or two longer with the script because it's it, the, the 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 it's not really chronological or there's a jump here that's hard to follow or it ends kind of abruptly or I would would have loved to use another concrete example or an analogy told a little story or something. And that all happens in the script writing process. So um, yeah, stay with the script a little longer <laughs> and uh, leave, yeah, step away from the project when it's when you don't have the, the energy to keep going. <laughs> that's that's a, a very vague answer, but uh, it's hard to kind of say exactly when to step away from uh, a piece of content. It's, um, it's, a, it's a tough balance. And, then, and so then, um... I'm curious, you know, there's always this, this struggle that, that kind of the, the balance you have when you have a video is you don't want to bore your learner, but you want to convey the information effectively. And so when you're, you know, you, let's say we've selected an idea, we've started writing our script. What are some of the decisions that we need to make in order to keep that right balance between conveying the, the, the information in our bullets effectively and keeping viewers kind of engaged with, you know, a story or a metaphor? I think it's a, a balance, as you say. How do you create, like, uh, you find a, a point between TikTok crazy and academia dry, right? You want to you wanna kind of find, and I think it's, it's nice to look to YouTube, for example, where you have a lot of very skilled uh, educational content creators who teach in a very engaging way. Um, so if you are able to, um, for example, front load, front load the information, like put your main message or the most interesting thing about what you're going to talk about, put it up in the beginning so you don't save it for uh, five minutes into the video, right? That's just a simple thing, the hook as you talk about, right? What can you say in the, in the first 20, 30 seconds, or if it's an explainer, the first five seconds that uh, gives the viewer an idea of what this is going to be about. Should I invest my time in this? And also, is it going to be uh, interesting to me? Um, but it's a it's a hard balance. I think I've I've gone too far in both directions. I've made very dry and boring and long informational contents that I can't stand uh, watching today. And also in the other direction, I've I've kind of edited too uh, tight too YouTube inspired, too silly, too funny, too crazy, too loud. And I also can't stand watching that, right? So you have to find your personal flavor, your personal style that you can do long-term, that you can, <laughs> that you actually are proud of and that you like to rewatch. I think that's a good proxy that you can actually watch your own content and that it's, it's interesting to you. Um, and that's about, you know, keeping a high pace, but still make it information dense. Um, using YouTube uh, kind of TikTok um, dynamics to keep the viewer engaged, but not let it ruin the, the core message and what you want to say in the video, right? So yeah, difficult balance. Yeah, it's definitely tricky there. I, I think to what you're saying though, is I, I, I you know, coming from the world of e-learning and uh, traditional, you know, learning courses, I think, something that our audience typically miss, misses the point on and has since what feels like since the 90s is that uh, especially instructional or training video is so incredibly dry. And I know that if you're a traditionally trained instructional designer, you're like looking at Mayer's multimedia theory and just thinking, oh, like it has to be just a couple words on a screen, no music. And I know that I personally, the, the creator in me doesn't want to watch that. And I know that uh, the audience doesn't want to watch that. So I love this idea of, you know, striking that balance somewhere between like the hyper engage, uh, hyper energy of social media and, and those channel video on those channels. And then also that academic research, knowing that if you skew in either too far in either direction, you're not going to make it. Do, do you think that folks who are getting started, the, the, the people who you work with, when they're getting started in the creation process, do they tend more towards the YouTube side and draw inspiration from there and you have to bring them back? Or 
are they more on like the academic research side because they are subject matter experts? I think, um, I think they are believers when they come to me. They believe in the animation formats. They like my style. They've found me on YouTube and they believe in fun learning like I do. And, uh, and that's a really nice um, thing about you know, uh, content marketing, organic traffic, that people find you, they like you, they believe what you believe, and then they contact you. And they are on board with the, with the idea that let's keep the pace high, let's use humor, let's use animation, let's make it fun, light, short. Um, and then of course the challenge they come with, and the reason why they come to me is because that's very hard. That's very hard to con convert everything they are used to produce of content, everything they're used to talk about, uh, their uh, subject uh, matter, um, it's hard to, to kind of convert that into that kind of wrapping, right? They have they have the thing, now they have to wrap it as a gift and give it to their uh, to their people. So, um, so the challenge is not really that they don't see the kind of the, the value in in wrapping the information nicely, that it doesn't appeal if it's not nicely wrapped. Uh, uh, is it a Marshall McLuhan? Uh, the medium is the message, right? The medium kind of um, rubs off on the message. It's important how you, the vessel around the information does something to the information. So, so they understand that idea that um, just because the information is there on our intranet, uh, everyone is going to read it, right? That's sometimes the, the, the mindset if the PDF is there on our internet, everyone knows it, right? And it's it's much harder than that, as all IDs and uh, e-learning experts know. One of the challenges that I've run into is that you know working in L and D is that uh, there's no actual um, science-backed research that says that video is in fact more it, more useful than text. Meaning, you know, because of the a lot of the studies that they do are in lecture hall or in a lecture setting or in MOOCs, which is not quite the way that information is learned in video now in L and D. And so a lot of people kind of try to avoid using video. But I think when you, what the, what the science does show is that, um, vi learners do prefer video with text rather than just text by itself. And I think, um, it actually doesn't have to be as good as face to face teaching because it's much better at getting in the hands of the learner, right? So accessibility matters, scale matters, reach matters. So, well, you can have the best course in the world, but if no one shows up, uh, it, it can be super effective and backed by science and research and all that stuff. But if you need to kind of uh, create that explainer video that reaches that person, that gives them that 60 second overview, and then they come to your face-to-face -face lecture, the video itself doesn't have to be as effective in its capability of teaching than you have, right? So I think it's not necessarily a reason why you shouldn't use video. It just can't compete with the face-to-face -face teaching. I'm, I'm sure it's not as effective. I really like this niche that, you, that you're that you using video for, which is, you know, this idea of a teaser. It's a, a teaser, a primer, maybe something to whet your appetite before you make a, lo a bigger decision. So um, it, it has a, a really nice place there and, Maybe it's that's where the engagement and the curiosity comes in um, when it comes to, uh, for the topic. It, it comes from your video and you're, you're sort of driving that. I think something you also just touched on there is uh, delivery and format. How are people going to be using this? I know that or how are people going to be seeing your information? I know that if I were on, you know, the, the Metro and I had my phone out, I would much prefer to watch a video as opposed to try to read a PDF on my phone and my phone is where I spend a lot of time, both for work and for personal, but also for learning. And so uh, the teaser, uh, you know, a video teaser can kind of be that perfect uh, delivery format to reach your learners kind of where they're at at this particular moment. Uh, the next big part to, to think about is this idea of storyboards and visualization. And I know that uh, this is kind of a little bit of where, you know, your, uh, I think our, uh, I'm going to group myself in there, but our design philosophy is not to use storyboards. And just for those who are new to it, storyboards are when you have your script and maybe the frame that goes with that script uh, to kind of lay out the video before you go into your video authoring tool. But I've seen you talk a lot about skipping this step. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Why skip storyboarding and, and kind of what's your approach? What should you do instead? 
Um, my kind of um, the reason why I don't like storyboards is because I saw that it would drag out our uh, production process when we used to do videos for clients. So the clients come to us because we have an expertise in simplifying complexity and converting those ideas into visuals. And that last part is a skill. It's very hard to do if you haven't done it a hundred times. So the client's idea of what would be a nice visual for this uh, th this this message or this sentence is um, is fine. It's it's good with input, but at the end of the day, what they also pay for is our ability to create those visual ideas to find something that makes sense. When I say uh, every day we challenge industry standards, All right? That can be a pretty dry sentence. How do we show something that actually gives that sentence any meaning and roots it in something? Then they can have their opinions, but we actually said that we will do the first draft of the video and then show you, instead of do a whole storyboard, show you, discuss, discuss, iterate, 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 and then at some point we are ready to start animating. So that's, that's where it comes from, my, my hesitancy about this. I understand that storyboarding can be a powerful collaboration tool. I'm a big believer in sketching, uh, sketching on a whiteboard to share ideas and synchronize uh, frames of reference and, and kind of uh, to be on the same page about how you see something. Um, but it has to be about the information and not about, not about the visualization. So of course you can align on uh, ways to describe something or um, what you are going to say in this kind of uh, um, a su subject matter expert might have some good ways to describe something that you can use to convert that into visuals and you can use kind of storyboards or shared notes or sketches to kind of um, make them or make you understand what it is that how they used to explain this on stage for example something that resonates with their audience they've described it this way a hundred times and it, normally that resonates like you can align on that through sketching or storyboarding but um, i just think it, it's important to kind of distinct uh, those two different tracks uh, not not letting your subject matter expert or your clients be the visual expert, but having them kind of uh, do what they're best at, talk about that topic, and maybe uh, communicate some of those analogies or examples through sketching or shared notes or whatever medium you use to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's very helpful in terms of getting a client up to speed. You know, you like we said before, you want to just get that version out there so that you have something to start iterating on. Uh, I'm curious, what if we were talking about the individual creator, you know, somebody who's at a, you know, at a company who's asked to create a video, like I'm thinking about where your story started, where somebody asked you to finish a video, I'm assuming you just got the script and you maybe didn't have SRV in, in your mind at that point, but you did have to go into visualize your visualize that script, visualize that in some sort of way. So what was that process like if you're going from the words on the page to starting to think about the images or what this might actually visually start to look like? Yeah, I see it as uh, two different levels. Like the, the level that you uh, aim for in the beginning is to match what is set to what is shown. So the goal is to match. You, you simply have to find, if I say um, a word, then I find a visual illustration that shows that word. That's fine, that's, that's level one, right? And that's what you should aim for in the beginning to kind of uh, sync those two so there's nothing confusing about what you show. You can't show something else than you write or you can't write something else than you say. So that's just matching the thing all the way through. The voiceover says something, the visuals show it. Level one. And when you can do that, you can level up to level two. And level two is about expanding on what is said. So now you say a sentence and you show something that makes it even easier to understand than if I only had the voiceover. So here you elaborate visually on what is said. Uh, in, in one of my courses, I, I show the uh, process of photosynthesis. That's a process we all learned in elementary school, biology. And if I just tell you quickly, you probably won't be able to tell me exactly how CO2 and sugar and air and water and how that all thing all, all works. But if you have a visual site that actually shows the tree and you have some bubbles in the air with the different chemicals that go in and out of the tree that actually expands on that description, elaborates, makes it easier to understand. And it doesn't just match 
uh, what is shown. You could just show a tree that matches, uh, right? So, so I think that's two different levels to aim for, and the level two is is difficult, but that's where animation really uh, has its place when you can uh, elaborate on what it said instead of just match. Mm -hmm. And, and oh, I think that 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 distinction between matching and then really truly visualizing something, uh, you know, in, in a creative way, I think is useful for that level one matching. What happens if I'm, let's say I'm, again, I'm just getting started on this journey um, and I have no idea where, how I'm going to visually match these things. Uh, what, uh, what, what can I do for inspiration? How can I start that process if I'm starting from nothing? I'm an SME, got a script. I'm totally not creative. What can I start to do? In all these uh, online tools we use, there are usually libraries of assets, props. So you just search for what is said. Like if I say uh, 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 you want to climb the career ladder, ladder within the next five years or something, you want to visualize that, you just search for career, for ladder, for uh, um, uh, steps, uh, different kind of uh, synonyms for what the voiceover just said. If you don't find anything, go to Google, Google Images, and put those same words into Google Images, and you'll see a million pictures of different ways to show that thing. For example, if it's a progress or performance or something uh, rather um, kind of a generic a word, you don't really know how to, how to visualize performance. If you just search Google, you will find some different, uh, maybe a little stick figure that flies through the air or a strong arm or whatever, right? You will get a lot of ideas on how to visualize that. And I think that's a great way to match it. Also in these AI times, you can use ChatGPT. Just ask ChatGPT what, what would be uh, uh, meaningful ways to illustrate or visualize the word performance in an explainer video. And it's going to give you amazing uh, suggestions. What a fantastic! First of all, what a fantastic segue into our into our final topic. So, um, I, I I'm so glad that you took us there because I think there's a lot of potential now. You know, we're already. Uh, it, it's I I don't want to date this particular episode, but you know, there's been a lot of recent advancements, particularly looking at the impact of AI on content creation, and also the impact of AI on learning. You're talking about using ChatGPT to help you kind of ideate on images and, and things that you can use. Um, I guess, how else do you, you know, is this something that it, that you've kind of done experimenting with? Is this something where you start to see AI making a difference? And if so, uh, if so, how? I've uh, bought ChatGPT Plus and I use it very often because it helps with those two challenges we started to started the, the episode here with the script writing and converting something into visuals. Those two places, you can really use ChatGPT to, for example, uh, explain topic to me like I'm a fifth grader, right? Then you get a really good draft or a really good point of departure, um, a short uh, piece of text that uh, describes, uh, what do I know? Uh, uh, yeah, whatever industry or uh, topic you are, are trying to describe. You can use different props, you know, this whole uh, prompts, all these uh, prompt engineering uh, tools and plugins, but really it's just about asking ChatGPT to describe something simply using examples, analogies, a conversational tone of voice um, in less than, what do I know, 90 seconds. So there you would get a, a pretty good uh, point of departure for your scripts. That helps you make it short and it helps you find a kind of a high level approach to this topic where you have that curse of knowledge. You're so deep into the trenches of how to talk about this. There are so many things I can say. ChatGPT will pull you out of that and, and give you a surface level description of what you're trying to uh, talk about here, right? And the second thing, conveying uh, or converting things into visuals, um, especially with the GPT-4, you get uh, incredible suggestions also very creative suggestions to how you can uh, visualize something where you don't just match it, but where it actually seems like GPT-4 is able to suggest visuals that expand or elaborate on what it is that we are talking about. So I don't understand why these animation tools aren't further ahead with their integration of all this. Uh, a little bit in the script writing, but this idea of automatically matching 
the voiceover to something visual is is still uh, is still day one in that world. Um, I thought about starting a company myself where I would actually create this AI powered explainer platform where you just put in a, a topic, for example, and, and click enter, generates the script, the voiceover, and also the animations. Um, but it's it's probably uh, coming. I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt, we're seeing an explosion of a lot of AI enabled content creation tools. So um, we'll all definitely stay tuned for that. I think something I, I want to pull out of what you said out of your two suggestions as far as using uh, ChatGPT or GPT plus is that idea of formatting and reform restructuring your idea. I think that's one of the most underrated tips for, you know, asking it to explain things, but that idea of restructuring and reformatting an output to make it simpler for time or simpler mm. for a different level of explanation depending on your audience explain it like i'm five i think those are some of the best tips that that people often miss where you probably already done the work let's say in that script writing where what you mentioned at the beginning you run into experts who write too much and then if you could just copy and paste that into um, into you know something that uses a large language model, that's the easiest way to say, take this five minute script and make it two minutes or make it 45 seconds. Mm. It does the work for you. I certainly struggle with that skill. And I think it's ultimately what, what you get at when you talk about simplifying complexity. It's just one of the easiest ways to restructure information in my opinion. Yeah, and getting suggestions for analogies is something I use it a lot for these days. If I have a script and it's it's good, it's well structured, but it's a little dry. There's it lacks something to hold on to. Um, it's purely informational. Then you can ask ChatGPT to come up with analogies for uh, what do I know? Uh, a water bottle out of glass is like X, right? And then it can come up with five, ten different things that it is like, and then you can describe it using something familiar to describe something unfamiliar. Uh, something everyone knows to describe your own new product that no one knows. That is such a powerful um, um, semantic or lingual or kind of a way to make people understand what it is that you do instead of just talking, talking, talking. You use something they know to describe something they don't know. So now they know the thing they don't know, right? And then ChatGPT can really help with that. No, that, that that definitely makes sense. I think j just before before we sign off here, I'm I'm curious. You know, do you have a final takeaway for uh, new creators? Maybe one next step that if somebody who are listening to this now, you you would encourage them to start uh, start doing uh, right after this, or or something new that they could start taking uh, that they could start doing today. I think the biggest struggle, the biggest challenge is the the fear of putting yourself out there that's one thing like getting getting public with your idea or pushing your ideas or i made look i made this and put it on linkedin for everyone to see that's a scary thing so that's one thing that people struggle with when you've talked about all the srv all the structuring script writing all the technicalities of microphone how to use the animation tools they still don't create anything right and the reason why is the fear of of putting yourself out there and also the 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 work it takes the um, um what do you call it this uh, book the the war of art resistance right there's there's kind of an energy that holds you back it's really hard to create content so if you can get over yourself first so you're ready to publish whatever you write and you can get over that resistance the the fact that it's so difficult to actually publish something um, and, and kind of uh, hold the pressure all the way to all the way to the finish line, and actually get it done, get it finished. Not just have those five, ten, eighty percent done videos, or that those ten PDFs that just uh, missed the last thing, right? I think those are the two main um, struggles. And if you can kind of uh, learn that and work on that, the rest is practicalities, I'd say. Mm. Not, not 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 to you know. Uh, to to kind of figure out a way to simply put that in in uh, simply put that it's just do the damn thing, do the damn <laughs> thing, get it out there, um, because I, I think to what you're saying that's what allows you to then iterate and experiment and create more. Um, yeah. Rude, this has been a fantastic conversation. If folks want to get in touch with you, uh, how can they get, how can they do that? You know, what can we uh, how can we point them to what you're what you're creating? They have to learn to spell my weird name, dot com. 
right? RuitRees.com is where I live online and RuitRees on YouTube is where I spend uh, a lot of time and, and, and uh, I have a lot of free content in there. So that's a good way to get to know me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes and we'll make sure we spell it correctly. <laughs> yes. um, but uh, Rude, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you.